Playing guilty to convict a guilty man does an injustice to everybody. Viva Fry, Montreal litigator turned YouTuber, and this is Winnie the Westie getting ready for his afternoon nap. And these are words that I didn't think I would be saying at the very least anytime soon. Bill Cosby is officially a free man. He is a free man despite being convicted on a second trial and having served over two years in jail. And the reason why he is a free man is because it has been determined that the prosecution played a little dirty in the prosecution of Bill Cosby. Now, not that I don't trust Fox News because I don't trust any news. I had to go straight to the judgment itself and the judgment itself is not kind on the previous prosecutor or on the lower courts. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Appley versus William Henry Cosby Jr. Appellant. Some of you might be more familiar with the fact pattern of this case. I personally was not paying all that much attention to the prosecution or trial of Bill Cosby at the time, but the overview of the facts in this case is that an individual named Andrea Constant alleges that in 2004, Bill Cosby gave her three blue pills and then proceeded to take advantage of her when she was in a semi-conscious state. Although Miss Constant alleges that this incident took place in 2004, she did not file formal charges until 2005, at which point the prosecution determined that there might be too many problems with the story, there might be too many issues to prosecute Bill Cosby, so they determined they would not prosecute Bill Cosby criminally to allow Ms. Constant to pursue him civilly. In evaluating the likelihood of a successful prosecution of Cosby, the district attorney foresaw difficulties with Constant's credibility as a witness based in part upon her decision not to file a complaint promptly. D.A. Castor further determined that a prosecution would be frustrated because there was no corroborating forensic evidence and because testimony from other potential claimants against against Cosby likely was inadmissible under governing laws of evidence. So the DA seeing fundamental problems in a potential prosecution decides that they will not prosecute Cosby criminally, but allow Ms. Constant to pursue him civilly, wherein she could force him to testify, wherein he could not plead the fifth for fear of self-incrimination, which is exactly what they decided to do. Seeking, quote, some measure of justice, end quote, for Constant, DA Castor decided that the Commonwealth would decline to prosecute Cosby for the incident involving Constant, thereby allowing Cosby to be forced to testify testify in a subsequent civil action under penalty of perjury without the benefit of his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination. Unable to invoke any right not to testify in the civil proceedings, Cosby relied on the district attorney's declination and proceeded to provide four sworn depositions. During those depositions, Cosby made several incriminating statements. In a nutshell, District Attorney Castor decided not to prosecute Bill Cosby, made a public statement to that effect. Bill Cosby felt empowered to testify without invoking the Fifth in the civil proceedings and did so proceeded to make incriminating statements during those depositions, after which D.A. Castor's predecessors did not feel bound by the public statements and agreement D.A. Castor came to. D.A. Castor's successors did not feel bound by his decision and decided to prosecute Cosby notwithstanding that prior undertaking. The fruits of Cosby's reliance upon D.A. Castor's decision, Cosby's sworn inculpatory testimony, were then used by D.A. Castor's successors against Cosby at Cosby's criminal trial. We granted allowance of appeal to determine whether D.A. Castor's decision not to prosecute Cosby in exchange for his testimony must be enforced against the Commonwealth. It would seem that the prosecution played dirty with Bill Cosby not only in respect of announcing that they would not prosecute Bill Cosby, which led him to believe that he could then testify under oath in a civil proceeding without incriminating himself. It seems that they played dirty also with allowing testimonial evidence of witnesses dating back to the 80s, but this becomes incidental once the court comes to the conclusion that the prosecution already announced they would not prosecute Bill Cosby, therefore they could not prosecute Bill Cosby. Having determined that a criminal trial likely could not be won, D.A. Castor contemplated an alternative course of action that could place Constant on a path to some form of justice. He decided that a civil lawsuit for money damages was her best option. To aid Constant in that pursuit, quote, as the sovereign, end quote, the district attorney, quote, decided that his office would not prosecute Cosby, end quote, believing that his decision ultimately, quote, would then set off the chain of events that he thought as a minister of justice would gain some justice for Andrea Constant, end quote. By removing the threat of a criminal prosecution, D.A. Castor reasoned Cosby would no longer be able in a civil lawsuit to invoke his Fifth Amendment privilege against self-incrimination for fear that his statements could later be used against him by the Commonwealth. Mr. Castor would later testify that this was his intent. Notably, when District Attorney Castor decided not to prosecute Cosby, he, quote, absolutely, end quote, intended to remove, quote, for all time, end quote, the possibility of prosecution because, quote, the ability to take the Fifth Amendment is also for all time removed, end quote. The trial judge was seemingly unconvinced by D.A. Castor's testimony, and D.A. Castor even had to clarify that this was only 
only in relation to Constant as a plaintiff and that if other alleged victims came forward, well then they would prosecute Cosby for those victims. The trial court sought clarification from Mr. Castor about his statement in his second email to D.A. Furman that he still believed that a prosecution was permissible as long as Cosby's depositions were not used in such proceedings. Former D.A. Castor explained to the court that he meant that a prosecution may be available only if other victims were discovered, with charges related only to those victims and without the use of Cosby's depositions in the constant matter. Specifically, former D.A. Castor stated that what he was, quote, trying to convey to Mrs. Feldman was that his binding of the Commonwealth not to prosecute Cosby was not for any crime in Montgomery County for all time. It was only for the crime in the constant case. So when the trial judge sought clarification from D.A. Castor as to the scope of the non-prosecution D.A. Castor specified that it was only as relates to the accusations of Constant and that if other victims came forward, they would nonetheless prosecute Bill Cosby for those victims, but they would not invoke his depositions in the Constant civil matter. And notwithstanding that, notwithstanding the fact that the D.A. in fact publicly asserted, publicly confirmed that they would not be prosecuting Bill Cosby for the Constant matter, Bill Cosby then went on to testify in that matter and they used his testimony in the civil matter to then prosecute him criminally for the Constant complaint. But despite all of that, the trial judge nonetheless came came to the conclusion that there was no non-prosecution agreement by the district attorney as relates to Cosby from the constant allegations. As noted, the trial court denied the motion, finding that then DA Castor never in fact reached an agreement with Cosby or even promised Cosby that the Commonwealth would not prosecute him for assaulting Constant. Instead, the trial court considered the interaction between the former district attorney and Cosby to be an incomplete and unauthorized contemplation of transactional immunity. The trial court found no authority for the quote proposition that a prosecutor may unilaterally confer transactional immunity through a declaration as the sovereign, end quote. Rather, the court noted such immunity can be conferred only upon strict compliance with Pennsylvania's immunity statute, which is codified at 42 PACS section 5947. On May 24, 2016, following a preliminary hearing, all of Cosby's charges were held for trial. Thereafter, Cosby filed a number of pretrial motions, including a petition for a writ of habeas corpus, a motion to dismiss the charges on due process grounds, and most pertinent here, a quote, motion to suppress the contents of his deposition testimony and any evidence derived therefrom on the basis that the district attorney's promise not to prosecute him induced him to waive his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, end quote. And this court comes to the conclusion that the prosecution's underhanded measures don't stop only at failing to respect the undertaking not to prosecute, it goes also to the evidentiary issues. On September 6, 2016, the Commonwealth filed a, quote, motion to introduce evidence of other bad acts of the defendant, end quote, which Cosby opposed by written response. The Commonwealth sought to introduce evidence and testimony from other women, instances that could not be prosecuted due to the lapse of applicable statutes of limitations. On February 24, 2017, the trial court granted the Commonwealth's motion, but permitted only one of these alleged past victims to testify at Cosby's trial. The issue as to the admissibility of other bad acts of the defendants is itself a very thorny question, and there is a line to be drawn as to relevant evidence and just an outright assault on the character of the defendant, and that might be a discussion for another day, but let's just get back to this agreement that was allegedly had between the prosecution and Bill Cosby that basically duped him into testifying without invoking his Fifth Amendment rights. The trial court was left to resolve these seeming inconsistencies. The court concluded that Cosby and D.A. Castor did not enter into a formal immunity agreement. Because the record supports the trial court's findings in this regard, we are bound by those conclusions. Pertinently, we are bound by the trial court's determination that D.A. Castor's actions amounted only to a unilateral exercise of prosecutorial discretion. This characterization is consistent with the former district attorney's insistence at the habeas hearing that what occurred between him and Cosby was not an agreement, a contract, or any kind of quid pro quo exchange. Here the court is basically saying that they are bound by the findings of fact of the lower court, and the findings of fact of the lower court is that Bill Cosby and D.A. Castor did not enter into any formal agreement, it was a unilateral decision from D.A. Castor not to prosecute Cosby. The the question now, however, is one of law in that is the unilateral decision of D.A. Castor not to prosecute Bill Cosby sufficient such that he cannot be prosecuted criminally after he testified civilly without invoking the fifth? And on that question, the court says the following. We are not, however, bound by the lower court's legal determinations that derive from those factual findings. Thus, the question becomes whether and under what circumstances a prosecutor's exercise of his or her charging discretion binds future prosecutors' exercise of the same discretion. This is a question of law. And on that issue, as a pure matter of law, the court comes to the conclusion that when a prosecutor makes the decision not to prosecute and formally announces that decision unilaterally, it is nonetheless binding on all future prosecutors. 
prosecutors. For the reasons detailed below, we hold that when a prosecutor makes an unconditional promise of non-prosecution, and when the defendant relies upon that guarantee to the detriment of his constitutional right not to testify, the principle of fundamental fairness that undergrids due process of law in our criminal justice system demands that the promise be enforced. While the prosecutor's discretion in charging decisions is undoubtedly vast, it is not exempt from basic principles of fundamental fairness, nor can it be wielded in a manner that violates a defendant's rights. The foregoing precedents make clear that at a minimum, when a defendant relies to his or her detriment upon the acts of a prosecutor, his or her due process rights are implicated. And although a great many people are rightly going to be shocked because this is going to result in Bill Cosby walking from jail, this is exactly what the court determines happened in this case. The prosecutor announced their decision not to prosecute Bill Cosby criminally, and he now felt liberated from invoking the Fifth Amendment to testify in the civil trial. And the court determines that this is a fundamental violation of due process constitutional rights. It sounds like this court understands that this decision is going to be wildly unpopular, but to this court, upholding the principles of the Constitution is more important than duping a guilty man into self-incrimination. In accordance with the advice of his attorneys, Cosby relied on D.A. Castor's public announcement that he would not be prosecuted. His reliance was reasonable and resulted in the deprivation of a fundamental constitutional right when he was compelled to furnish self-incriminating testimony. Cosby reasonably relied upon the Commonwealth's decision for approximately 10 years. When he announced his declination decision on behalf of the Commonwealth, District Attorney Castor knew that Cosby would be forced to testify based upon the Commonwealth's assurances. Here, only full enforcement of the decision not to prosecute can satisfy the fundamental demands of due process. And in order to really make their point clear for the lower court and the Commonwealth, the court ends by saying the following. The impact of the due process violation here is vast. The remedy must match the impact. Starting with D.A. Castor's inducement, Cosby gave up a fundamental constitutional right, was compelled to participate in a civil case after losing that right, testified against his own interests, weakened his position there, and ultimately settled the case for a large sum of money, was tried twice in criminal court, was convicted, and has served several years in prison. All of this started with D.A. Castor's compulsion of Cosby's reliance upon a public proclamation that Cosby would not be prosecuted. The CDO's remedy for all this would include subjecting Cosby to a third criminal trial. That is no remedy at all. Rather, it is an approach that would place Cosby nowhere near where he was before the due process violation took root. When an unconditional charging decision is made publicly and with the intent to induce action and reliance by the defendant, and when the defendant does so to his detriment and in some instances upon the advice of counsel, denying the defendant the benefit of that decision is an affront to fundamental fairness, particularly when it results in a criminal prosecution that was foregone for more than a decade. No mere changing of the guard strips that circumstance of its inequity. A contrary result would be patently untenable. It would violate long-cherished principles of fundamental fairness. It would be antithetical to and corrosive of the integrity and functionality of the criminal justice system that we strive to maintain. For these reasons, Cosby's convictions and judgment of sentence are vacated and he is discharged. This is going to be a decision that people are rightly going to find shocking. This is going to be a decision that a lot of people out there are not going to fully appreciate or understand and they are just going to think that this is another case of a rich celebrity getting their way and walking from criminal wrongdoing. And although that might be true to some extent because it requires a lot of money and resources to pursue this matter as far as Cosby has pursued it, like the court says, this is a matter that supersedes, that goes beyond Bill Cosby. Bill Cosby may very well be guilty, but you cannot taint the criminal justice system itself in order to convict a guilty man. But this court has had the courage to render what is going to be a very unpopular decision, but arguably a very necessary decision in order to preserve the integrity of the criminal justice system. And with that said, if you like my videos, you like my content, please be sure to like, share, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and drop a comment in the comment section below because it feeds the algorithm. Please, sir, I want some more. More? If you want to support the channel, all of these support links are in the pinned comment. We've got all the standard stuff. We've got merch. Robert Barnes and I do weekly live streams every Sunday. We do weekly streams with a guest every Wednesday called The Sidebar. We are also on Locals. If anybody wants to find us there and support us there, it is at BeavaBarnesLaw.Locals.com. All of my content is also on Rumble, so you can catch it there. But more important than any of that, take care of yourselves. Check in on friends and family. Make sure everyone around you is doing well. And now you know your vlog. Peace out. Oh, yeah.